So if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead back to Genesis 1. Just a couple of more times here in these opening chapters as we're working our way through seven different propositions or axioms. I'm not really quite sure what to call it, but an outline of what it means to be human. As those who have been wonderfully and fearfully made, um, what does that mean um, to be human? It's, it's highly contested in our world today, uh, this whole issue of, of being human. So we said, first of all, that to be human is to have a body. Second, to be human is to have a soul. Um, and this soul is not, uh, while it's certainly divorceable from the body in the sense that at death, this unnatural tearing apart of body and soul happens, we were made originally as body-soul beings. Um, we were to be embodied souls or spiritualized bodies. Um, to be human is to be both and, not, not simply body or not simply soul. We don't privilege the body over the soul, nor do we privilege the soul over the body. That's what it means to be human, is to be body-soul beings. But then third, we spent a couple of weeks looking at this idea that to be human is to be either male or female. Uh, and we talked about how contested that is in our culture today, but also why it's so significant. Tonight, uh, we're just going to take one week to, to touch on this theme, uh, that to be human is to be made in the image of God. Um, what does that mean? Uh, we use that language of image of God, Latin phrase, imagio Dei. Uh, what does it mean to be in God's image? We're going to discover that tonight as we look at these two key verses and think a little bit more uh, in the light of Holy Scripture as a whole. But in order to see what God has for us tonight, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. So let's ask him for his help. Would you pray with me, please? Holy Spirit, living breath of God, we pray fall fresh on us and open our eyes tonight that we might see glorious riches in this portion of your gospel as the middle set of songs declared, Jesus, you are, you are our hope, um, you are our king, you are the one in whom we delight, you are our savior, you are everything. The only way we'll truly know what true humanity looks like is to look at you. Lord, help us tonight. Grant us your grace, grow us into your image, conform us, we pray, to who you are, so that we might fully reflect the image of your father. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As Memphians, we are, we are very aware of the 1968 sanitation workers' strike. And we know the placards that they carried, which, it's, which proudly declared, I am a man. That declaration that was on their placards with which they marched through our city streets was actually rooted in this passage. They declared that I am a man because, because the Bible told them so. But it also had its roots in a, in a speech that the Methodist minister, the Reverend James Lawson, gave a few months before their march. On February 24, 1968, he had told the workers that at the heart of racism is the idea that a man is not a man, that a person is not a person, but you are human beings, you are men, you deserve dignity. It's striking if you go downtown to Claiborne Temple and you go to the I Am A Man Plaza, you'll find there at the base of the monument that quote, Lawson's reminder that these workers were human beings who had dignity, something that hopefully will remind generation after generation that, that human rights, basic human rights, are not rooted in the will of the government, nor are they rooted in the will of a voting populace. Rather, human rights are rooted in the fact we're human beings 
made by God and made in God's image. As we continue to explore what it means to be human, we, we need to come to this key point that, that humans, as, as body-soul beings, as male and female, we are made in God's image. Every single one of us made in God's image. Every single part of us made in God's image. The whole human being made in God's image. The whole of humanity made in God's image. But what does that mean? Theologians for two millennia, even beyond that, have debated what it means to be made in the image of God. Uh, our Reformation forefathers, both Martin Luther and John Calvin, saw being made in the image of God having to do with rationality. Uh, it's our reason, they said, that separates us from the beasts, from the animals, with whom we share being made from the dust of the earth. Calvin argued that the image of God rooted itself not in this body-soul combination that makes us human, but, but merely in the soul. And part of the reason he wanted to say that was he, he wanted to have some continuance for the image of God after death. When body and soul are torn apart, still the real us, if you will, our souls, uh, he argued, image of God. It didn't lose that sense of being the image of God. But I think there are some other answers for us um, that are rooted not just in this text, but other places in the Bible that help us see what it is to be made in God's image. Uh, and the first word or the first idea is to be made in God's image is to be glory bearers, glory reflectors. There's this great Calvin, not, not Calvin the theologian, Calvin the comic strip, Calvin and Hobbes cartoon in which Calvin is standing in front of the mirror in his underwear, and he's, he's striking a pose, flexing his muscles, and as he looks at himself in the mirror, he says, made in God's own image, yes, sir. To which Hobbes replies, God must have a goofy sense of humor. And there's times when we look at ourselves and we wonder the same, isn't there? Our bodies and minds don't work the way they should. Our desires are all over the map. We, we wonder what's happened to us. Is this idea that we are God's image, that we have something to do with his glory, is it, is it simply part of God's goofy sense of humor? Well, not at all. We were made for God's glory, and we were made to reflect God's glory. I think that's at least part of what it means to be made in God's image. Biblical scholars John Walton and Greg Beale have both suggested that this creation account here in Genesis chapter 1 meant to picture something that the ancient Near Eastern world would have, would have understood immediately upon reading it. They suggest that, that what Genesis 1 is describing is God creating the world as a temple, as a temple in which his own presence would be made manifest. Remember, God walks in his garden in the cool of the day. God comes to his temple, they suggest. And the ancient Near Eastern world would have grasped this idea of world as temple immediately and intuitively. But the difference between Genesis chapter 1 and those ancient Near Eastern myths was this. God made human beings not to be drudges, as it was in the ancient Near Eastern myths. Read Gilgamesh Epic, uh, other Greek philosophical myths, and you discover human beings are not thought highly of in those myths and in those philosophies. But that's not what you find in Genesis 1, is it? No, God instead makes human beings, he says, in our image, after our likeness. And he does so, I think, to be reflectors of his glory. In the same way that ancient Near Eastern temples had idols to reflect the glory of the God. The idea being you built this temple, you placed the idol there. Not only was the idol a means of encountering the presence of that God, but actually was serving as a reflector of that God's glory in his temple. So the true and living God was doing the same. He was making not idols, but human beings. And he placed them in his world, in his temple, to reflect his glory. 
And as, as human beings carried out God's creation mandate to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth, the earth would be filled with God's glory reflectors. God's glory would shine on his world and his, his human beings would reflect his glory back to himself so that the result would be this. The whole earth would be filled with God's glory. Of course, that's still God's creative purpose. You remember Isaiah's temple vision? What was it that the angels said? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the deep longing of every believer's heart is expressed in the psalmist's prayer at the end of Psalm 72. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. How will that happen? How does it happen that God's glory is reflected now? How will it happen then that the whole world will be filled with God's glory? I think it will happen as God's image is restored. As his image bearers are restored in such a way that they might reflect God's glory back to himself. That was what was corrupted but not annihilated will be restored and renewed in Christ. We will reflect God's glory because that was the reason for which we were made, made in God's image. But being made to reflect God's glory was not the sole purpose in being made in the image of God. We were also made to reflect something of God's own being, of God's own nature. For over three millennia, theologians have wrestled with these plural uh, pronouns here in Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And so God created man in his own image. Male and female, he created them. There, there seems to be some connection between God's own self-reflection, his own self-talk, if you will, as us and our, and God's creation of humanity as male and female. And that connection, I think, is, is that within God's own self, is, there is a communion of persons. That's what we mean as Christians when we name God as Trinity. We mean that Father, Son, Spirit enjoy love within the divine being as a, as a family of three, to use Jonathan Edwards' phrase, and yet as one God. It's the argument that C.S. Lewis makes in Mere Christianity. When he draws upon 1 John 4, 8, God is love to argue that God cannot be a monad, a single being, that in order for God to be eternally love, he must have had someone to love, and God loved within his own self. The Father loved the Son perfectly, and the Son reflected that love back to the Father, and the Spirit was the energy of love between the Father and the Son, that there was within God diversity and unity in love, a communion of persons. In the same way, as I suggested to you last time, our creation is male and female in God's image is meant for that, that purpose of showing something about God's nature. As, as male and female come together as one flesh, as one humanity, there's a communion of persons. There, there's a diversity and unity that images forth God. Of course, there's, there's other places that image forth God in this same kind of diversity and unity that, that, that the marriage relationship images is actually pushed out so that it's not just one man, one woman together, diversity and unity reflecting, but a yet greater people made up of male and female where diversity and unity are brought together like in the church. It, it's, it's striking that in Ephesians chapter 2, when Paul is, is encouraging his people in Ephesus with what the power of God has done, not just to them and individuals, but in their church, he talks about how the power of God has been displayed in bringing Jew and Gentile together. Racial diversity. In fact, racial diversity that represents a racial divide, a kind of almost hostility. And yet Paul will say in Ephesians 2 verse 13, um, but now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. 
that he might create in himself one new man, or the NIV has, one new humanity in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Twice, Paul uses language that echoes back to the creation, a new humanity, one body or one flesh. How is it that that these racial others, Jew and Gentile, how is it that they they form a new humanity? How is it that they, they come together as one flesh? Well, through the cross of Jesus Christ, through his shed blood, this is how God brings diversity and unity together, that images forth God, that serves as a new humanity. He does so through Christ's own work. And that communion of persons that, that diversity and unity, where is it pictured best for us in the church? Well, we had it this morning in communion, where we as div- a diverse people become one, one body, one flesh. How? Through our common participation in the bread and through our common participation in the cup. And so to be human is to be made in God's image. And part of God's image is this idea of a communion of persons that just as God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, expressing that within God there is three, a communion of persons in which diversity and unity is brought together. So it is in us as his humanity, as his, as his image bearers, we display this same nature, the same character, as reflectors of his glory, yes, but also in enjoying a communion of persons, this godlike delight and love among diverse persons. But finally tonight, the, the Reformed tradition has most frequently viewed the image of God as having to do not just with glory and not just with communion, but with goodness. Now, you, you don't find that idea in Genesis itself. No, you have to go to the New Testament and to the work that Christ is doing in restoring the image of God in us. And there are two passages in particular where Paul speaks of the restoration of the image of God in us. The first is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. There he writes that we are to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness, and holiness. And then Colossians chapter 3 verse 10. Do not lie to one another seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and verse 10 have put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge, excuse me, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So in that first passage, the Ephesians 4 passage, we hear that the new self um, this this new way of being in Jesus Christ is created after the likeness of God. That's Genesis language. After the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So in, in Ephesians, Paul suggests that the original likeness of God was ethical. It had to do with goodness, with being righteous and holy. But in the Colossians 3 passage, He says the new self is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. There's image language. And it's connected to knowledge. And so the the original image of God, if you will, was epistemological. It has to do with, with knowing. Adam and Eve knew truth because they knew God. Taken together then, the Ephesians 4 passage and and the Colossians 3 passage we might then think back to our original design as humans and say with the theologian Herman Bobbing that we were created ethically mature with knowledge in the mind, righteousness in the will, and holiness in the heart. In other words, we were good. Part of being made in the image of God is that we were good. We were the way we ought to be. We were in harmony with God. And we were in harmony with God's world. Human beings in the garden knew right from wrong. 
to obey God's word was right. To disobey God's word was wrong. Humans could choose the right. They could choose righteously. They had the ability to obey as well as the ability to disobey. And human beings experienced the holy. As God walked among them in the cool of the day, they experienced the holy without guilt or shame. For they were holy too. Of course, this was all corrupted because of our first parents' disobedience and fall. And yet, the Reformed and Presbyterian tradition has said that, that the image of God remains in every human being. It's not annihilated. Um, some wrongly suggest that about the Reformed tradition, but they are wrong. No, for, for our tradition, we want to say that every human being has some knowledge of God, which they suppress in unrighteousness. They have some sense of justice, though they regularly choose injustice, but it's also why every culture around the world has some sense of taboos, of, of, of cultural standards that define right and wrong. Even though to us they might look strange, still, to obey the taboo is to do right. To break the taboo is to bring judgment upon oneself. And every culture has it. And, and every person in every place has some sense of the holy, some sense of the sacred. Even the atheist, the fool who says in his heart there is no God, when he's in Alaska or when he's in upper state New York and he sees the northern lights, he knows he's standing in the presence of the holy. When he stands on the edge of the Grand Canyon and he sees the sun cresting over in the west and he sees the full moon rising in the east, he knows there's something luminous and he's standing in the presence of the holy. Every human being has this sense of the divine even though they turn it to superstition and idolatry, which means that every single one of us, we're still image bearers. There is a fundamental dignity that every human being has as a human being. To be sure, our own sinfulness and the enemy himself delights to deface and destroy God's image in us. But as James Lawson said over 50 years ago, you are men and women. You deserve dignity because God made you. And because this is the case, even when we run into people who act in ways or do things to themselves that are counter to the divine design, we must honor the God who made them, even when they're caught up in a web of brokenness and sin, of their own fault, perhaps, or not of their own fault. We, we must honor the God who made them and honor the image of God that remains in them by treating others with grace and dignity and truth and compassion. One of my favorite Southern writers is Flannery O'Connor. Um, I love her because she is shocking. Um, and when she's shocking, she forces you to think in different ways. And she usually has some theological or spiritual point she's trying to make. In her essay, a, a Temple of the Holy Ghost, or excuse me, in her story, A Temple of the Holy Ghost, she, she, she tells a story that actually has as its larger point um, a Roman Catholic understanding of, of the sacramental host and, and why it's believable to think that, that God could make bread into the body of Jesus, even though that appears to be freakish to us Protestant folks. But in order to get to that theological point, she introduces this scene in the midst of the story. This 12-year-old girl has two of her cousins who have come from the Catholic convent school to stay with her mother and herself for the weekend. And these two girls have gone to the fair um, with two boys that the mother had, had rustled up to just get them out of the house because she and her daughter were exhausted by their talking. When the girls came back, they, they had all sorts of stories about what they saw at the fair. And one of the stories was about this tent where this freakish woman was, where people went to see this woman who was both woman and man. The little girl doesn't really know what to think about all this, this freak that others saw. But as she's trying to picture this scene as she's falling asleep, she ends up with this dream 
that comes to her as she's fading away. The way O'Connor has it is she was better able to see the faces as she's falling asleep of the country people watching the men more solemn than they were in church, the woman stern and polite with painted looking eyes, standing as if they were waiting for the first note of the piano to begin the hymn. She could hear the freak saying, God made me this way, and I don't dispute it. And the people saying, Amen, Amen. God's done this to me, and I praise him. Amen, Amen. He could strike you this way. Amen, Amen. But he is not. Amen. Raise yourself up, a temple of the Holy Ghost. You, you're a temple of the Holy Ghost, don't you know? Don't you know? God's Spirit is dwelling in you, don't you know? Amen. And if anyone des des desecrates the temple of God, God will bring him to ruin. And if you laugh, he may strike you this way. The temple of God is a holy thing. Amen. Amen. And I am a temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And then the little girl falls asleep. As I say, O'Connor uses this scene to say something about the sacramental host. But surely it is the case that what O'Connor is testifying about this, this freak, this woman who, who's also a man, is also true. A temple of the Holy Ghost, or we might want to say made in the image of God. There are those who, who walk among us in our culture who have made decisions with which we will disagree. Whether it's those who have embraced a transgendered identity, whether those who have embraced a same-sex relationship, and we will be right based on what the Bible says to say that's not what God's design is. But even with the wrong choices and even with the harm done, those men, those women, are still made in the image of God. They have dignity. We must treat them that way. Because even with all the brokenness and all the difference and all the wrong choice, they still need to know of the love of God in Jesus Christ. And how will they hear if the ones who have the message treat them with indignity rather than dignity? As James Lawson reminded us, you are men, you are women, you are human beings. You have dignity made in the image of God. Amen. Would you pray with me, please?